Good morning, it's April 19th. I'm driving out to the cemeteries again. Can't even tell you how many times I've done that last year. But uh, a lot. July 7th. It is Monday, August 5th. February 24th, I believe. April 21st. I am at Oakwood Cemetery, West Rondell. The oldest graves that we have here in our family are the Fargo graves. And those are the grandparents of, of my great-grandmother, Grace Matthew. So, I'll try to give you a little history. It's, I find it kind of confusing. But uh, Alpheus was born uh, November 16th of 1809. And he lived until February 1st of 1895. Rebecca, his wife, was uh, born uh, March 5th, 1821. And she lived until December 7th of 1897. Now, they were married in, uh, on September 1st of 1840, when Alpheus was 30 and Rebecca was 19. I'm quite sure they were both from New York. They moved to Illinois and then uh, later moved near Chatfield, Minnesota. And first child was James Henry Fargo, uh, born in 1843, three years after they were married. I uh, don't know anything about him at all. Uh, the second child was Lucretia, and that's my great great grandmother. And then the third, I'll get back to her in a minute, but the third child was Franklin, uh, Franklin Alonzo Fargo, uh, born a year after my great-grandmother, great-great-grandmother, and uh, 1846. And then the, the fourth child was L.J. Fargo, Leonard Fargo, uh, who was born in 1855, uh, died in 1931. He moved out in 1882 and settled near Stratford. And when he was 44 years old, he married uh, Katie Bell, and her grave is back here. She was 18 when they got married. They got married on Christmas Day, and she died was just within a few months. Uh, in 1890. Uh, I can't see a stone for L.J. Fargo, but I'm going to guess that he's probably buried here because Katie is, his parents are. I'm going to assume that, that he's buried here somewhere and just don't know where. So back to child number two, my great-great-grandmother, Lucretia. Uh, she married Lester Monroe Benson on her 19th birthday, uh, which was July 12th, 1864. So actually got married just shortly before her brother Franklin died. Lester was born in New York, born to a French father who was a carpenter and an English mother. And they had four kids. Uh, Leon Paul, who was the oldest, born in 1869. And then there was Lloyd Park, uh, he went by the name of Park, uh, born in 1871. And then they had a set of twins, uh, Alice Faith, and she went by Faith. And then my great-grandmother, Olga Grace, she went by Grace. Uh, so they were both born on Christmas Eve of 1874. When the twins were born, uh, the doctor thought that Faith was born dead, and so he put the child in, the, in a shoebox and shoved it under the bed. A few minutes later, Faith started crying, and so he pulled the shoebox up from under the bed, and she actually uh, survived and lived until the age of 59 after having six kids. 
but my, uh, my great grandma did point out several times that, that Grace was never in very good health. And uh, uh, Lucretia died when the girls were four and a half years old. And then the family moved to Grand Meadow uh, just a couple years before uh, Lucretia died. So in 1882, uh, Lester, or Let, uh, as he was known, uh, and the two boys moved to Dakota Territory. Uh, the girls uh, stayed back, I think with the grandparents, in the Chatfield or Grand Meadow area. So when they moved out here, Lester was 43, uh, Leon was 13, and Park was 11. Lester homesteaded uh, southeast of Stratford. Then the next year, 1883, uh, Alpheus and Rebecca brought Grace and Faith out here to join the family. Alpheus was 73 when they came out here in 1883. Uh, Rebecca was 62. Uh, Lester did wind up remarrying a widow by the name of Sue Rapp, uh, who had one son and a quarter of land. They were divorced within two years. And then he married another widow, uh, Gertrude Walker. I think she had four kids, and they were soon divorced. Then in, in 1897, uh, Lester was elected to the state House of Representatives on the populist ticket, and he hated it. Uh, he did not run again. He was quoted by his nephew as saying it was, the legislature was damn rotten, and he wanted no part of it a very good speaker. He trained to be a minister. And there was a neighbor by the name of Charlie Messer who probably was on the opposite side uh, of the fence as far as the politics were concerned. And Lester's nephew, uh, Leslie Benson, uh, quoted Charlie Messer saying, uh, Dad Gummit, I can think it as well as let, I just can't say it like he can. So there seemed to be some admiration on Charlie Messer's part for uh, Lester. But uh, Lester said of Charlie Messer, according to nephew Leslie Benson, that Charlie was the, the jawbone of a horse's ass. Apparently not too much respect there. And as for the Benson children, uh, they were all musicians. They played for many dances in the area. Leon was on violin. Park it was also played the violin, but then switched to the bass viol for the purposes of the orchestra. And then the twin girls uh, both sang and played the organ, switching on and off. So yeah, that's the history that I know of. So I am going to move over to my great grandparents because I great-grandmother, Grace, married Milt Matthew. Okay. If I can get up. So now I've moved over here to Grace and Milton's graves. I had to get in my Jeep and warm up in between because it's only 38 degrees and the wind is blowing at least 10 miles an hour. And it's cold. But if I'm not dealing with the cold out here, I'm dealing with mosquitoes. So, I prefer the cold. My great-grandma Grace, uh, January 1st, 1895, married Milt Matthew, who was the 12th child out of 19. I know they were dating in 1894, and I, I have a letter that he wrote to Grace uh, Apparently she said that they should go to a picnic, and he couldn't go because his brother was going to go. And uh, so Milt had to mind the store. Uh, his father, Peter Matthew, uh, had four children with his first wife, Anna. And then Milt was number eight uh, with Milt's second wife, uh, Joanna. Uh, his first wife had died. And Milt and several of his siblings grew up in Alma, Wisconsin. And then two of his brothers, William, who was the second 
a child uh, with the first wife. And then Frank, who was number nine altogether, a uh, child with the second wife, or number five with the second wife, uh, moved to, the, to Dakota Territory. And then when the uh, town of Verdon was established, I believe 1886, they opened a store there. And they invited Milt to join them, and he did so in 1889, when Milt was 21, and when South Dakota became a state. So, uh, so that's kind of how that that played out. Milt uh, also became involved with banking, and he had an elevator in Randolph and was quite successful and uh, built a large home in Verdon. And then later um, moved to Aberdeen and bought a very large, beautiful home there. But then things got a little rougher financially and then they traded down to, it was still a large home, it just wasn't as large as the first one. And then eventually the stock market crashed, uh, basically bankrupt him. So Milton and Grace raised six children in Verdon. There was Reese, the oldest, then Merle, and then my grandfather, Homer, and then Hazel, and then two younger boys, Clyde and Morris. Great grandpa Milt helped my grandfather Homer get established with a grocery store in Brentford in 1924. He wound up dying in that store uh, November 4th of 1929. So just shortly after the October stock market crash, Milt had brought some flour down to the Brentford store for my grandpa and was carrying the flour into the store when he had a heart attack and died. Grandma Grace wound up uh, moving down to Brentford, just a block west of, of the grocery store, and to a tiny little house. And of course, I used to visit her quite often uh, when I was in high school and then later on, because uh, I was uh, 29 years old when, uh, when great grandma died at the age of 101. So, obviously, I never knew Milt, but uh, definitely knew Grandma Grace. I remember Grandma Grace uh, from the time that she was about the age I am now, uh, talking about uh, how she felt so old and felt that she could die at any time, and, and uh, her legs always hurt. But, uh, and she did have some trouble walking, but uh, she toughed it out for a long time after that. I'm going to warm up again and then move on. Still 38 degrees. Uh, Chelly, supposed to get up to 71 today, but boy, it's got a long ways to go. I am now sitting between the graves of my mother's parents. Homer Benson Matthew, 1901 to 1952, and Gladys Ruth Swim to Matthew, 1905 to 1974. I was four years old when my grandpa Homer died, so I really don't remember him. Uh, so anyway, even though I don't remember Homer, uh, I have quite a few of uh, his personal effects that uh, Grandma Gladys gave me uh, because I was the only grandchild they had who Homer got to know. Uh, so anyway, um, my Grandma Gladys, uh, Granny as I called her, uh, got to know very well. Uh, she ran the store in Brentford. And I would 
stop at the store well, almost every night uh, during the school year. Yeah, sometimes I would help in the store. I spent a lot of time with her at her home, and watch Lawrence walk together quite often, and then we would work on coin collections together. And then when the store was too much for her and she basically handed it over to Janice and Jim and then she took up hairdressing, Gladys moved to Watertown while I was in college and, uh, and then she had a shop in her home. She wound up having a stroke and went into a nursing home. And died quite young, so age 69. Gladys mm -hmm. and her two older sisters were born in Elmwood, Illinois, um, to Frank and Myrtle Stanley Soil. Frank wound up coming out to South Dakota two months after Gladys was born, and then uh, a month later, Myrtle and the three girls came out and joined, and Frank was a hired hand, and so they lived south of Frankfurt until uh, Gladys wound up marrying Grandpa Homer. Um, I believe uh, January 12, 1926, and January 12 is also an uh, anniversary for Vicki. On. I think it is, the sun is coming out, almost coming out, so I don't think I have to run to my Jeep to warm up between this session. I moved to the graves of my great uncle Clyde Matthew and his second wife Nan, which sit just to the west of Homer and Gladys' graves. The wind suddenly picked up to the point where it was almost impossible to hear me, so I had to settle for doing this voiceover. Clyde was the second youngest of the family, and he's the one I knew the best of Milton Grace's children. He and Nan spent a lot of time with my parents, visiting with them, fishing with them, swimming with them, and partying a lot with them. My folks found it rather difficult to keep up with Clyde and Nan because, well, Clyde didn't really do anything half-hearted. He flew airplanes, drove sports cars, motorcycles, loved martinis, wine, cigars, outdoor activities, guns, and competition. But let's drop back in time to the days before he enjoyed those luxuries. After spending his first five years in Verdon, Clyde made the transition to Aberdeen with his parents older sister Hazelbell, and younger brother Morris. Life, no doubt, was uh, pretty sweet for the next ten years, but then his world turned upside down. Clyde was fifteen years old and a freshman at Aberdeen Central High School when his father suddenly died of a heart attack. Grace, Clyde, and Morris managed to stay in Aberdeen through Clyde's sophomore year, but by then their funds had run out and they were forced to move to a tiny house in Brentford, which was one block west of my Grandpa Homer Matthews grocery store. Clyde enrolled at Brentford High School his junior year, but was quite unsettled. He was often late for school, or skipped school entirely, and ended up dropping out after only a few weeks. He got a job at Pete Boss's bar, started dating a Brentford teacher, Ursula Morris, and ended up marrying her on February 18, 1933. Their daughter, Yvonne, was born in 1934. In 1936, when Homer and Gladys's family headed for California, they stopped to visit Clyde, who was working at Hearst Mercantile in Leeds, South Dakota. His address in 1938, as seen on this letter, was 206 and a half Park Avenue in Leed. 
Clyde began taking flying lessons at the Spearfish Airport, was a flight instructor by 1942, and joined the Army Air Corps. He soon introduced his son Gary to air travel, and later he and Yvonne both got a taste of life in the cockpit. Clyde became a pilot for United Airlines in either 1944 or 45, at about the age of 30. And about 10 years later, he met a flight attendant named Naomi Panat, who went by the name of Nan. At the time, Nan was dating a minor league baseball player by the name of Ralph Terry, but she dumped him for Clyde. Clyde and Nan were married in 1958, and she had no regrets, even when Ralph was named World Series MVP in 1962 when the New York Yankees defeated the San Francisco Giants four games to three. Clyde stepped down as a captain for United Airlines when he reached the mandatory retirement age of 60 in 1974. Clyde and Nan left their home in Camarillo, California, and in retirement split their time between Lake Havasu, Arizona, and their South Dakota cabin north of Custer, in the vicinity of Mount Rushmore and Crazy Horse. They enjoyed summers in their Custer cabin most of all, and tried to spend at least one winter there, but after becoming frighteningly snowbound, returned to winters in Lake Havasu. I met Yvonne and her family a few times, and I may have taken this 1969 photo on the left when they visited my folks and my sister Diane on the farm. I probably first met Gary around 1950, but I got to know him very well when I slept on his floor in Torrance, California, until my buddy Larry Syrie and I got jobs in our own apartment in the same South Bay Club. We've managed to stay in close touch over the years, and it's been interesting to see how Gary has matched Clyde's interest in cars and far exceeded his dad's enthusiasm for motorcycles. But thank goodness Gary doesn't share Clyde's passion for those stinking cigars. Nan passed away on August 31st, 2008, and Clyde was laid beside her about four and a half months later, after he died on January 17th, 2009. Clyde had spent his final weeks at the Aberdeen Health and Rehab Center, where Diane and I would visit him quite often, listen to his stories, and occasionally bring him his favorite Bitburger beer. As you've probably gathered by now, Clyde's forceful personality generally led to things being done his way. So right toward the end of his life, Diane and I were taken aback one day after Diane asked if he wanted to do something. And he said to us, No, but I'll do anything you tell me to do. Diane and I looked at each other, quickly stepped into the hallway, and checked the name by the door, just to make doubly sure that we were in the right room. I am driving on Highway 37, South of Groton to the used to be town of Burden, South Dakota. I'm on my way to shoot a segment on Reese Matthew, the oldest child of Milt and Grace Matthew. I shot a segment on April 23rd on Reese and Hazel in the Condi Cemetery because that's where they're buried and they're buried in the Condi Cemetery instead of the Oakwood Cemetery where the other Matthews are buried or a lot of them and because uh, Hazel uh, was a Cleveland she grew up in Condi and so she got her wish of being buried near her hometown and relatives the reason I didn't use that footage is because it was a little too noisy, so I decided to reshoot and 
I'm doing so this afternoon here in the town of Burden. So you might have to use your imagination a little bit. Up ahead to the right, you can see Uncle Reese and Aunt Hazel's house still standing, still pretty straight, gotta say. Reese uh, lived his entire life here in Burden, other than post-retirement trips uh, to Texas mostly for the winter. Reese was born October 3rd, 1896, and straight ahead, he would have been uh, above his father's store, which on the left, and the family lived there well, about 10 years, I believe. But both Reese and Merle were born above the store. And then I believe in 1899, Milton Grace built a house north of town. And the other kids were born there. There was a schoolhouse, a grade school, not too far from the left, probably about where the buildings and bins are here and that's where uh, Reese went to grade school he wound up graduating from Aberdeen Central in 1914 and one of his classmates at Aberdeen Central was his cousin Leslie Benson uh, Leslie was actually two years older but they uh, graduated together anyway now Grandpa Milt had his store he was president of the local bank, and he had some land, and he also had an elevator in the town of Randolph, which is about six miles to the west of Verdon here. And when, uh, when Reese was 20 years old, Milt made him a deal. He said, Reese, if you will manage my elevator in Randolph for a year, then at the end of the year, I will pay you $1,000, which significant sum at that time. So Reese did so. Apparently it worked out okay because on Reese's 21st birthday, October 3rd of 1917, he received a check of $1,000 from his father and he kept that canceled check. He took the money, took the thousand dollars, and purchased the store across the street from Milt's. It was known as the Osborne store. Opened his own business, which was uh, Matthew Mercantile, the R.A. Matthew. And according to his cousin Leslie Benson, he was in direct competition with his father. I just find it very hard to believe that. So I'm going to guess that they had some type of agreement where one would handle a certain type of goods and the other would, would handle something else. Could be wrong, but uh, I've never heard of any stories of any family animosity, at least between Milt and any of his children. So I'm going to assume that, that Leslie was wrong on that. But even if they were in competition, it wouldn't have been for too many years because... Milt store burned down along with the, I think almost the entire north side of Main Street in the early 20s. Now Reese's store that he bought on the south side of Main Street was actually the first business built in Verdon. And ironically, it was the last building to stay in business. After Uncle Reese retired, Howard Noggle bought the store and had his grocery store and post off in there and and I remember the store quite well and I shopped for groceries in there I enjoyed shopping in the store because it, the floor was very uneven you always had the feeling that you you might fall through but uh, if you let your shopping cart go it would take off and go down to a, a low spot in the store Howard retired in the 1970s and the building stayed empty until it was demolished, I believe, in the 1980s. It was still standing in 1986, but I don't know how much longer after that. 
And the only building that's on Main Street that's still standing right now, uh, hardly recognizable, is the Opera House that was built in 1916. And we have a family connection to the Opera House because Reese's cousin, Leslie Benson, married Belva Feller on November 9th, 1916, and that was the first event held in the new Opera House. And it's still standing down there. It's now used as a storage shed and a shop, and it's been recited. Doesn't look like an Opera House at all. So about uh, five months after Reese received that $1,000 check from his father, not only did he buy a business, but he also married Hazel Cleveland on February 28th of 1918. And my grandpa Homer was the best man, and Hazel's sister Alice was maid of honor. Uh, Reese and Hazel had two children. The older of the two was Grace, and she married Garf Polkinghorn, and they had two children, Joyce and John. Got to know Grace and Garf, both very nice, very smart. And Reese Jr., everybody called him Junior when he was young, but then uh, went by Matt when he was an adult. Matt was in the Air Force during World War II and made the military his career. And then he had one son who was Reese Alfred Matthew III, and the third had a son who is Reese Alfred Matthew IV. And the latter two are pediatricians. It's time to turn to Great Aunt Merle, Lucretia Matthew Taylor, who was the second oldest child of Milton Grace. Now, here we are, a rainy afternoon, South Dakota, dodging clothes and stuff that somebody lost out of their vehicle. But uh, with the windshield wipers going here, Aunt Merle spent her entire adult life in Southern California. So if we're going to talk about Aunt Merle, give her background, isn't it only fair that we give her better weather? Kind of Southern California weather? Well, it seems that way to me, so I think that's what we need to do. So, there we go. Aunt Merle was born December 28, 1898, when her brother Reese was just over two years old. Both Merle and Reese were born in the living quarters above Milt's store in Verdon. I don't have many photographs of Merle when she was young, but this 1901 or 1902 photo of Reese, Homer, and Myrtle is definitely a classic. Myrtle was fortunate that Milt and Grace were fairly prosperous when Myrtle was in her teens, because she definitely had a penchant for style. And that style led her straight into the flapper era of the Roaring Twenties. She married Earl Taylor on September 3rd, 1919, when Merle was 20 years old. She and Earl lived at 3745 Floral Drive in L.A. and owned a lumber business in Boyle Heights, which is east of downtown L.A. and southeast of Chinatown. At one point, they even had an oil well, Taylor No. 1. and I never saw them drive anything but a big Cadillac. Merle and Earl had one son, Alan, who was definitely a cute kid and a handsome young lad. And my best guess is that he was born in 1921 or 1922. As you can see, 
He was a teenager when Homer and Gladys visited in 1936. From left to right and back are Gladys, Merle, Margie Smith, who was a cousin who came along to take care of the kids, and Alan. In front are Homer, Jim at age five, and Marlis at age eight. Homer's family drove out in the store's two-seat panel truck, which meant that Margie, Marlis, and Jim sat on a mattress in the back of the truck for the entire 4,000-plus mile trip. My first trip to visit Merle and Earl was as a four-year-old in the back seat of my folks' brand-new 1952 Ford. While my accommodations on the road were probably better than Mom's and Uncle Jim's, I'm betting they had more fun, because I didn't have anybody to play with. I don't remember much of anything about the trip, but I'm guessing, knowing Uncle Earl, there was fishing involved just as there was in the 1936 trip. Alan and his wife Lorraine had two kids, Dale, who was born around 1943, and Jeff, who was probably born in 1952. We hardly got back home from our 1952 California trip before Grandpa Homer died, so within a matter of days, Merle and Earl were visiting us in South Dakota. I made at least one more trip to visit Merle and Earl when my folks, my sister Diane and I, went out there in 1969. And again, there was the Cadillac. Merle was always quite good about sending letters and photos, keeping everyone up to date, as she and Earl aged gracefully in their California paradise. So here we are at the uh, Capitol Theater in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And the reason I'm here is because it has a connection to great aunt uh, Hazel Bell Matthew Walker. So first of all, uh, Hazel Bell uh, was born uh, July 19th, 1905, and she was nine years younger than the oldest sibling, uh, Reese, and then it was nine years until the next child was born, uh, great uncle Clyde, and she was born in the family home on the north side of Burden, rather than above the store, which the first two at least were born. Hazel went to grade school in Burden, as did her older siblings. And she attended Aberdeen Central High School, as did Reese, Merle, and Homer. The difference was for Hazel, she did not have to leave her family to do so because Milt and Grace moved to Aberdeen in 1919 and moved into a big beautiful house there. Then after graduating from Aberdeen Central, Hazel attended Northern Normal for a short period and then she got a job as a secretary for uh, Dr. Carson Murdy here in Aberdeen. So then the connection with the capital comes in starting in 1925 when a man by the name of Harry or Henry, I'm not sure uh, where the Harry came in, but his real name was Henry Leon. Um, the papers say Harry Walker was in negotiation with the Narragang Company here in Aberdeen to build a Capitol Theater, which is before us. The building was completed in 1926, and on April 19th of that year, uh, one of Harry's sons, Marion, married Hazel Bell Matthew, which was just three months after uh, her brother Homer married Gladys Swim. The Capitol Theater here opened on January 12th, 
1927, which coincided with Homer and Gladys' first anniversary. Now, the first production in the new theater was a stage performance called The Green Hat, a play with a punch. And I'm curious to know if uh, Homer and Gladys maybe came up to see this production in a way to celebrate their first anniversary. That play also developed into a movie, a silent movie, in 1928 that I'm not sure if it ever actually played here. There's another family connection to the Capitol Theater. And on the 75th anniversary of the opening of the Capitol Theater, Vicki and I got married on stage in this theater because that's basically where we met. Uh, we didn't know it was the 75th anniversary at the time, but, uh, but anyway, that's the way that turned out. Now, the first silent movie to be shown at the Capitol was Kid Boots. And the last movie shown here was Robocop 2 in 1990. Now, after Hazel and Marion got married, they moved from town to town because Marion managed uh, one theater after another. And as close as I can figure, shortly after they married, they moved to Huron, South Dakota to manage the Bijou Theater. Then after they left there, uh, they had short stints in Wisconsin and then back in Aberdeen. And then they returned to Huron's Bijou Theater in 1942 until 1948. And I know uh, that Anne Hazel sold war bonds out of the Bijou Theater while they were living in Huron. Um, from there, it was on to Minot, North Dakota. Yeah, while they were living in Minot, they would come back to this area to visit relatives. And I remember them coming out to the farm. And Marion soon became my favorite great uncle because when he would come back to visit, he would bring me a large grocery bag plum full of popcorn, theater popcorn. Now leaving Minot in uh, 1957, uh, Hazel and Marion moved on to San Diego and he managed the El Dorado theaters there. Uh, they retired in San Diego. Uh, Marion passed away in 1980 and Hazel passed away uh, four years later, November 4th, 1984. Uh, she was 79 at the time. And they were both preceded in death by two infant children, uh, Marianne on uh, February 10th, 1927. So this is Mary. Marianne. Marianne, okay. And Thomas on January 4th, of 1929. They were survived by a daughter, Marilyn Jean, who later married J.T. Walsfoot. And, uh, and they had three children, uh, Dan, Julie, and Jim, and they all grew up in the Denver area. So there you have it, the Aberdeen Capitol Theater. Morris, born in Burden on May 27, 1917, the youngest of six children, spent only the first two years of his life in the young town before his parents took full advantage of their prosperity by moving to Aberdeen. Burden's population was already declining, dropping from 136 in 1910 to only 90 in 1919, a 34% decrease while Aberdeen enjoyed a population growth from 10,753 in 1910 to over 14,000 in 1919, a 35% increase. 
Milt was savvy enough to perceive that both trends would continue. But, like millions of other businessmen, he could not anticipate the wildly fluctuating economy of the 1920s. If he had studied past post-war recession, he might have given more thought to how the end of World War I could cause a period of deflation, and would therefore have been more cautious about buying the elaborate and expensive pond house at 502 South 6th Avenue. The 1920-1921 recession, combined with the loss of his Verdon store from fire, made it difficult to hang on to the pond house much beyond Hazel and Marion's wedding in 1926. In 1927, the family moved the block west to the smaller Vodish house at 502 South J. It was still a respectable home and named for the local jeweler who built it several years prior. Milt was again caught by surprise, first by the global devastation from the October 1929 stock market crash that ended his prosperity, and then by the November 4th heart attack that ended his life. Before Milt died, Morris had no doubt enjoyed his privileged life in Aberdeen. Playing tennis, apparently using two rackets at a time, showing his niece Marlis how to ride a bike, or at least how to sit on one with a little help, and riding around in the family car, a fancy Willis Knight touring car. He and Clyde had paper routes, as indicated in a letter from Morris to Grace, dated June 26, 1931, while Morris was spending some time in Burden visiting his oldest brother, Reese. Take notice of Morris's nice handwriting, which seemed to be a Matthew trait. Also note his willingness to pay Clyde 80 cents to cover his paper route. And perhaps the most telling aspect of the letter? His signature, M. M. Matthew Incorporated. Remember, he was only 14. Grace, at age 54, Clyde at 14, and Morris at 12, somehow managed to hold on to the Bodish house for two more years before enduring the humiliation of moving to the little town of Brentford, population of 132, and living in a tiny three-room house, where the living room no doubt also served as a bedroom for the two teenage boys. Morris and Clyde both enrolled at Brentford High School in 1931. Morris as a freshman and Clyde as a junior. Both became involved with Brentford's music program, but while Clyde never quite clicked with the new school, Morris seemed to fit in quite well. He was president of his class, both his sophomore and junior years, gave basketball a try his junior year, but decided he was better suited as a cheerleader his other three years. Later on, as adults, both Clyde and Morris displayed considerable self-confidence, perhaps bordering on cockiness, and apparently Morris got an early start with that attitude, if there's any accuracy in the high school newsletter, where he received plenty of ribbing. But even if his mannerisms rubbed someone the wrong way on the paper staff, it seemed to serve him well as a salesman later in life. Morris had two versions of his senior picture taken at arts photography in Aberdeen, but one of my favorite photos was taken the following year when the four Matthew brothers got together in front of Homer's panel truck. On September 2nd, 1939, at the age of 22, Morris married Myrna Quist, not Quest, as reported in the newspaper. His mother and brothers made it to the wedding in the Twin Cities, but not his two sisters. There are 1941 photos of Morris and Myrna in front of their home in St. Paul, and another of Morris with nephew Jim and niece Marlis. In 1942, Morris and Myrna made a trip back to Brentford 
to show off their new son, Kent, who was born on May 14th. The photo was taken in Homer and Gladys' front yard. Morris then took a photo of Myrna at the old Oakwood Trading Post, northwest of Brentford, and several photos of Myrna in Aberdeen. Morris joined the Navy during World War II, and in 1945, while stationed in New York, tragedy struck when Myrna was giving birth to their second child. Complications arose, and neither Myrna nor the baby survived. A couple years later, Morris married Doreen, and with her raised two daughters, Linda and Carol. Morris built a successful career with several companies before retiring in the San Antonio area. He passed away on January 15, 2007, at the age of 89.